Thank you very much, Debza. And maybe I should say table for your father is here. So <laughs> thank you very much. And good morning to to all of you. And thank you for making time to join us today. And those who are at home streaming from the office, thank you very much for taking time. And a particular thanks to those like my mother who have come a very long way to be here and other members of family who have come a very long way. So there is a challenge with a day like today because party politics has come to center South African life in so many ways. And so we come to events like this and expect a manifesto and expect a list of solutions and many big promises about what people like ourselves and the hundreds of people that are part of what we are doing nationwide are going to deliver for all of you, for everyone. But I'd like us to reflect on what really is missing. South Africa is in this state not for lack of political parties. There is something else that's missing. Our society is broken. It's not the load shedding that demoralizes us. It is the sense that we've lost the ability to deal with it. It is not the presence of crime that is utterly depressing. It is the sense that those who are tasked with fighting crime are themselves criminals, and therefore we can do nothing about it. We are demotivated, demoralized, and in despair to the extent that those who leave our shores now it's not just white people. We know it's black people. It's young black people. It's young black women who are feeling very unsafe in South Africa. It is people educated and nurtured in this country that are going to donate their talents elsewhere because we cannot be the country that we need to be. And so I want to start with a warning that one of the things we need to understand about this work that we're doing is that we are very clear that merely winning or contesting an election does not fix South Africa's brokenness. We have lost the belief that we can win, that we can succeed. We know it. We are demotivated. Turning that around is not the work of the ballot only. Political power is really important because it enables you to change laws, to use institutions, to allocate resources in order to drive the change. But to fix a society, a whole society, takes a lot more. It takes civil society, it takes families, it takes communities, it takes the faith-based communities, the church, the temples, the mosques. But how do we restore that? How do we restore that? Can we just elect people and say then it's going to be restored? We've tried that for 30 years, it hasn't worked. And so I'd like us to look, at least to listen to my remarks in that context. But before I get into the formal part of my remarks today, so let me tell you about the place I come from. I'm from Ganduli in the Eastern Cape. Many of you have never heard of it, unless you've read my columns when I talk about it, but you've probably never heard of it. If you have, you have never seen it, and you may never see it in your life. But this is where I herded cattle, I looked after sheep, and I tilled the land from 3 a.m. for maize, beans, and pumpkins. My grandfather was a subsistence farmer we produced all senza, all echana, all saloons. Those are versions of pumpkin for those who don't know. It's not people. 
It is this life that explains why, personally, I'm here today. So Mkanduli is a place where, at three weeks old, my mother had to leave me in the care of my grandparents so she could find work as a teacher. And when I was old enough and working, I set down my own roots there and built a home. The Lipoduga, that's where I go in December. Those who know I'm a Koduga know. So as much as we speak English in the cities and we end up in, in you know, in the cities we end up in, and, and in events such as this, deep down some of us are instinctively village people. And for important occasions like this, my instinct is to speak is the cause, which brings a certain sense of gravity to the matter. So please bear with me and my village stories just now. And please forgive me if my English bundles run out occasionally. But the village is what I know, and the best way I can articulate why the work we do is unavoidable. So to get to my village, you take the coffee bay and hole in the wall off ramp off the N2, just south of Mtata. Anyone who has been on the road to Coffee Bay will tell you it is even hard for four by fours. In some places, driving off road is safer than what remains of the tarred road. I can tell you confidently there is someone watching me right now who is confirming this to the person sitting next to them. That road is bad. And the 62 kilometers can take up to two hours to navigate if you are not familiar with it. Two hours. And Mkanduli is a typical small town under this government. It is collapsing under the weight of political neglect. The neglected government buildings on one side of the main street are located on land that used to belong to a local family, confiscated by the colonialists in the early 1900s. On either side of this road and all the way to Coffee Bay are homes and communities that have never had pipe water or a flush toilet, ever. The town itself doesn't have a municipal sewerage system. And because there is almost no spatial planning, people have no specific addresses. So if you are coming to my home, you have to ask, who pick was Zibi? Babuze, Abapi, Emakomeni, Oganye, Guzuelisha. Oh, Shokwatisha. But not having a specific address means an ambulance, when one can be found, struggles to find houses when there's a medical emergency especially at night. I'm 47 years old this year. I have never in my entire lifetime seen an ambulance fetching someone from my village. I have never. I accept that in the time that I have lived here, maybe that happened, but it is hard to locate someone's home. So people ask for a car to take someone to hospital. And sometimes people die waiting for an ambulance or the, on the slow journey to hospital on that road that I was telling you about. So those of us who are from there leave our loved ones for the cities to earn a living. This is the same journey that our forefathers made to the mines, leaving families, communities, land, and communities that struggle to, rein, to retain the structures that make communities functional and stable. It is here that somehow people must find work in a local economy that virtually doesn't exist because the only thing going is the public service. Yet this land is some of the most fertile in the country. Its natural tourism assets are world class, but there is very little infrastructure around them. The people of these communities, our communities where we come from, are unseen, unheard and uncared for. If you get out of your car and you walk those villages, you will find that almost all of them are black. And most of them are black women. Daily they toil to build a life for their children and try to hold their communities together. At night they live in the dark and sometimes are terrorized by crime which is sometimes committed by young people in the community who have no opportunity and no hope. 
These are young people who are introduced to the prison system at an early age. And when they come out, they can no longer find work because they have a criminal record. And so we talk about solving unemployment without even seeing these thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. So the story of Mkanduli is the story of every little rural town or township in South Africa. It is a story of dispossession, of spatial exclusion, of racist oppression, of destruction of family and community structures, and denial of opportunity. It is a story of political neglect and structural violence. It is a story of past and present trauma they bear with dignity. It is a story that all of us must care about because we want to be one people united by the same values and sharing a dream of a country we all deserve. This is why we cannot entrust this work of reconstruction just to political parties. That's why beyond political power, you need a broad social and political movement. It is not true that you can just elect a political party and everything will be okay. Let us not allow ourselves to be like children. But the dream of this South Africa is something we have lost as politics has come to symbolize corruption, the arrogance of power, and an embarrassing eagerness to conclude political deals and the people be damned. South Africa is the only country in the world where it may be possible for one person to be a mayor of two places in one term. Come on, come on, come on. What are we going to do next? Ask Obama to be our president next? The very concept of mayorship is that I live in this community. I'm invested in this community. That's the whole point. But we have a system where it is possible to shop one person around to three, four, five towns, and they can be mayor, and the people have no say. Tell me there is nothing wrong with that. So this story underlines how much unfinished business we have in South Africa. This should not be the case after 30 years of democracy. Why is democracy when that kind of deal making happens? What we need to fix is more than what any of us are going to put on any of those manifestos. This is why vision is important. This is why vision is important. Like I said, it's not so much that we have load shedding that depresses us, is that we know it is not going to be solved. That's, that's the thing. We know it is not going to be solved. So today we've invited you for two reasons. First, are you okay? <laughs> today we've invited you for two reasons. First, we are tabling a grand vision and framework of how to significantly change South Africa to stop this crisis, stabilize a country, and deliver the fruits of democracy. That work is a generational mission that will transcend elections and draw its sustenance from millions of people who will become part of this movement. Second, Rise Mzansi is registering with the IEC to contest the 2024 elections with a national list across all nine provinces. You cannot achieve the vision we set out and the sweeping changes we propose without political power. We know even the electoral reform bill came out of litigation because we're a political system that does not listen, that does not care. None of you here matter. None of you count. You have to spend millions to go to court to get the political system to listen to the people. That's unsustainable. Our goal is to build a country based on the principles of justice, freedom, equality, solidarity, and integrity. 
These are not just Rise Mzansi's values, but the values we believe must anchor how we revive the South African dream. They are for all South Africans. We cannot have justice when we are surrounded by economic injustice. We cannot have freedom unless we wipe out poverty. We cannot have equality if we do not end inequality. We cannot have solidarity if we do not have a new non-racialism that sets out to end racism and build real national unity. We also cannot have integrity while the corruption is driven from the very top. That level of transformation needs the participation of all of society. We speak about non-racialism and non-sexism without ever talking about how we're going to end them. We talk about poverty alleviation, which means you stay poor, but you just make it a little less painful. Come on. Are we aspiring that low? Why don't we set out to build prosperity in South Africa? This is why we are building Rise Mzansi as an inclusive movement. It cannot just be done through an election. It's important. We will contest it. But this needs the participation of South Africans in all walks of life. These values and goals must be a way of life that informs what we do in politics, in civil society, in business, in the public service. We have become a society ruled by politicians, guided by laws they ignore and divorced from any moral anchor whatsoever. We trust people. What is the South African idea? What outrages us? What brings us together? We have come to trust personalities to hold us together, and when they fail us, we fall apart. New dawn. It's dark. It's dark. This is what happens when we slogan here and we don't do the hard work of actually building nationhood. We are led by individuals who lack seriousness and depth, and they have no respect for the South African people. The reason we are in this crisis is not for lack of good people. It is because the good people have yielded the political space to those who do not deserve it. We somehow find a reason, any reason, to feel unqualified to do the work of the nation. We make excuses. We are never happy with anything or anyone, and yet we do nothing. This is our country. This is our democracy. It must be a societal mission to return both to the people. This means getting involved today and not tomorrow. And it means getting rid of the same political game and its tired practitioners who have brought us to this point of crisis. The gains of our democratic South Africa have gone into reverse. Violent crime is at intolerable, intolerable levels. Only countries with wars have more violence, murder, and attempted murder than we do. Our economy is dying for lack of electricity and growth because of political neglect, incompetence, and corruption. Unemployment today is higher than it was 15 years ago. It is. Look it up. Millions of people are lucky to have all three meals a day, and too many children suffer from hunger and malnutrition and stunting. And yet we talk about economic freedom. How? How do you achieve that liberation when you are hungry? Our municipalities are falling apart. Our roads, bridges, and railways are crumbling before our very eyes. We remain amongst the world's most unequal societies with historical fault lines according to race and gender and so on. The corruption that is endemic to the ruling party has spread like a cancer into the state and the rest of our society. We now have too many people with no sense of what is right and wrong anymore. People who argue until they blew in the face. And they say it was wrong for Judge Edwin Cameron to blow the whistle 
on the on the on the on the on, on, on Tabo Bester's escape. They say it. They use that word. They say it was wrong, and they mean it because we've lost our way. Our foreign policy, previously a light among developing nations, has moved from non-alignment to a complete misalignment with our constitutional values. It's opportunistic, confused, and backwards, and probably transactional in terms of money. South Africa needs a reset. It needs a new direction. It needs new energy. It needs new leadership. But we have to recognize that our political system is broken. Instead of a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, as a democracy is supposed to be, we have a government of the political parties, by the political parties, and for the political parties and their bosses. That is how one guy can be mayor of more than one town in one term. That is why you wake up one day with one mayor, and you, the previous day you had a different one. And you had absolutely no say in how that came about. That's a broken political system. We've got to fix it. We have a political system where to get anything done, you have to litigate. Our political system, our national politics today, is like a used furniture shop. Every piece has been bought and sold many times. Every piece has been slept on, spilled on, stained and ravaged by time. Some of it has been stuffed with foreign currency. <laughs> Every piece has witnessed shady deals and false promises, whether shouted or whispered. At one time, this furniture was fit for purpose. Now it needs to go. We need new furniture. It must be cleaned out. It is not going to carry itself out the door. Furniture never does. Someone has to carry it out the door. In a democracy, that is the people who do that. So the establishment tells us there is nothing wrong with our political system, and all that is needed is to remove the ANC. But we cannot build a new future on a political system that is unaccountable, unresponsive, it is corrupt, and so removed from the people. We cannot use the same rules that delivered the unserious people who call the same leaders today to drive the change we're talking about. We must be bold and change the rules. So our documents that we released today set out a political reform program that can finally deliver a real democracy. But the political system is not the only thing that is broken. The nation building project has also lost its way because apart from the destruction of corruption, we have also not delivered economic justice. And probably as a result of the two being linked. Instead, prominent politicians whip up nationalist and racist divisions to mobilize their political bases and drive us further apart. There is not a single political party today that can claim to have a program to build national unity in South Africa. Not one. We use race now as a currency to problematize some among us so that we can create excuses for the failures of the last 20 to 30 years. We do that. So if you get rid of this community, everything will be better. You get rid of those ones, everything will be better. It's a lie. The ruling party has come to represent failure, despair, incompetence, and corruption. Millions of its own supporters deserve a better political home, one that takes their dreams seriously, instead of using them as fodder for personal enrichment and power. The largest opposition groups have reached a dead end electorally and politically. Many of their voters, too, want to see a competent and competent and, and capable partnership that can unite South Africans and lead our country effectively. And then there is a minority with crude sloganeering, with an unmistakable hint of violence on their breath that threaten to tear apart our country's democratic fabric. Those are options. Those are our options. 
They thrive on the politics of despair and anger, but no practical solutions. We have been divided and taken advantage of for too long. So Raizim Zanz intends to unite South Africans around a goal that until today has remained only in words. And that is, the people shall govern. It is simple, it is trite, but it is true of all democracies. It is not true of ours. So Raizim Zanz's vision is to build an equal, safe, united, and prosperous South Africa in one generation. In 20 years, a child who is born at the beginning must not have to worry about finding a job when they leave university and want to go and study and work overseas because in their own home, there is no opportunity. They get looked down upon, downtrodden, scrub floors when they come from a country with so much. We, so we know this cannot be done overnight. But that work is urgent and needs to start tomorrow and proceed with urgency. So our movement is open to South Africa, to every South African who wants to build a nation that cares. This is the work of patriotic South Africans, not party loyalists. So we stand for a society that is fair, where class, race, gender, or disability do not determine who succeeds in life and who doesn't. We want a country that is governed by the rule of law, where life is not cheap, and the powerful are equally subject to the law. We get used to things too easily. Debs has spoke about the loss of his friend. We have had two people gunned down uh, on New Road. We had five people gunned down in, uh, in Port Elizabeth, in Gabecha, where I used to live. We have had uh, Lois Onkotla being gunned down in broad daylight. That's the country we are. We want to be a society where economic justice and inclusion, growth and investment are not opposing concepts, but part of the same package that delivers a prosperous life. Prosperous life, And it's, it's possible. We want to be a nation where climate justice is about human well-being and protecting our natural environment. And not this fight between the elites about who gets coal or renewable contracts. That's what this thing has been about. If you go on social media, that's what it's reduced to. But rural subsistence farmers are losing their livelihoods. I know. I come from one such family. People's homes are being swept away by floods. Thousands of people in the coal belt have respiratory illnesses. So what are we going to talk about in the media and, and everywhere else? Who gets coal and, and renewable contracts? Really? Surely we're not suggesting that those people be forgotten again. So our movement, Rise and Zanz, was not, born, was not born in that use furniture shop I spoke about. In November 2022, hundreds of South Africans met, as Makashule said, and they discussed what kind of country they wanted to build and how to build it. And what followed was that pledge to be loyal to the South African constitution, to work together to build an inclusive movement driven by the people to contest the elections in 2024 and beyond, to work in our communities and volunteer to find solutions to make them safe and prosperous, and to develop ethical, accountable leaders capable of leading our country and communities. It is this pledge that has brought us here today and will fuel the building of this movement. Those who would hastily dismiss us should understand that we didn't just come and stand here. We started on the ground are building and are building up. This, this is what it means to say the people shall govern. That said, there are four urgent thematic priorities out of this story that I've just laid out. The first is political reform, to return democracy to the people and build a capable state. That political reform program must include electoral reform, government reform, and judicial reform. These efforts will underpin the cleaning up and capacitation of the state to professionalize the civil service. You can't have a corrupt and broken political system and, and a capable state at the same time. You can't have both. The second is safety. South Africans are unsafe in their homes, in their communities, on the roads, and in their places of work. It is not just violent crime that is keeping us in distress, 
but communities that are overwhelmed by drug trafficking, drug addiction, and the disintegration of social structures. Let me give you a challenge, those of, us, those of you with the, with the appetite. You can look at the finance minister's speech. You can look at what is called the budget review. It's a thicker document. It's a several hundred pages long. All the estimates of national expenditure, which is longer, it's over a thousand pages long. It's got reports on the past three years and the next three years as a six year picture. You tell me where in any of those documents there is anything said about the drugs pandemic in South Africa and what to do about it. There is nothing. And yet we trivialize and we laugh at Amapara. Effectively, people since then who's fallen into drug addiction. If you want to know how this government no longer even understands how to reshape the state and distribute resources, go and look at that budget. It bears no relation to how people live and what they experience. The third is building an economy that creates jobs and opportunities for everyone. South Africa is not poor. We should not be having so much poverty. We have natural wealth such as minerals that are critical for the green economy. We have world-class tourism assets and we've got Arab land for producing enough food for every South African and exporting it to the world. But to continue to have people who live in hunger. We have a world-class financial system and deep capital markets. But our economic policy is essentially about keeping the post-colonial structure intact. We are also failing to get very basic things right. Mining investment has lagged other mineral-rich countries because our licensing system is corrupt and inefficient. We export far less than we should because we have killed investment in mining. Companies pick up and leave municipalities that are being run to the ground by corrupt cadres, leaving hundreds of people unemployed and their families without an income. So this illustrates the importance of municipalities to deliver basic services and rebuild the economy. We know our municipalities are falling apart. We know water and sanitation are failing, and to say nothing of electricity. Localities are riddled with crime. But every business exists in a locality. We cannot rebuild this economy while the very areas in which we hope to build it are falling apart. There are very interesting debates about the mandate of the Reserve Bank and, and so on. All of those things are important for the clever people. But I can tell you there is no amount of tinkering with monetary policy that will create an economy in a municipality that does not function, that has six mayors a year. There is nothing you can do. We must accept that we have to do the basics and to get those basics done, we must get the old furniture out of the room. Earlier I spoke about the road to Coffee Bay. So you tell me, how are we supposed to build an economy and create jobs when there is no road? How? How do you even transport anything that you're going to sell? Finally, we must root out corruption not only in national government and state-owned enterprises, but the degrading, humiliating corruption people suffer through at local level. A job in Palabura, we were told, costs about 15,000 rand in the municipality. In Rustenberg, it's about 8,000 bucks. If you're a woman, you have to sleep with someone to get a job. I know we talk about Palapala and so on all the time, but you see, the reason 70% of people don't vote it's because we don't talk about the corruption they live with every day. Because we don't see them. So 2024 is our 1994. We are at a crossroads now. If we do not intervene now, it will be too late. We need something deeper than just party politics. We need a shared vision, a shared value system, and an inclusive culture that seeks to unite and involve all South Africans. Our population is very young, and yet the future is being destroyed by people who think young minds and talent belong in leagues and agencies, but not at the center of politics. I'm 47 years old. Some people call me young. <laughs> Seriously, they do. 
Dave Cameron had been prime minister three years when he was my age. Rise Mzansi is an opportunity for young South Africans to lead and build a different future. To those in the current system who reduce politics to the art of the deal, we say no deal without the South African people. Those who say South Africa is broken beyond repair, we say we are, you are wrong. We are all here. This beautiful land belongs to all of us and it's worth fighting for. Now, there are people who say they care. They have a lot to say. But they are waiting for a perfect politics a perfect political alternative. Nothing and no one is good enough, but they never want to get involved with anything. In the same way that those who are destroying this country right now will have to answer to history for what they did, because it looks like they'll never have to answer in the courts, we will have to answer for what tweeting delivered. This is an opportunity to decide what our respective legacies are going to be, to define our own struggle. Speaking of struggle, the first time I witnessed a death in my family was in 1982. The day, the following day, uh, we were going to get uh, Christmas clothes, so we were very excited. And, and a man came, we thought he was a special branch policeman, and he came and he stood by, parked by the gate and waited for my grandmother to, my grandfather to arrive. And when he came in, he went inside to see him. And that actually was a lawyer called uh, Prince Matigizel. The, the older in this audience or listening might know him. And he was there to tell, to tell my grandparents, who are effectively my parents, that uh, my uncle had died. He was an MK soldier. He was killed in 1982 in Lesotho, along with 41 others. He was 23 when he died. Whenever I come home, his grave stares at me. Past struggles should matter. We cannot drive past Dalibunga's grave in Kuno and look at it as a tourist attraction. It matters. We have to build the South African nation. South Africa has to rise. We must rise. We must decide whether we're going to take charge of this country or we're going to die in despair on our knees because we think we're unqualified to shape our own future. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you.